The Willamette Valley ecoregion is the heart of Oregon's population. With an area just over one-tenth the size of the state, it's home to over three-quarters of all Oregonians. The valley includes large metropolitan areas, surrounded by lush, fertile farmlands. But most valley dwellers are unaware of the vast changes that have occurred here since the first people occupied the Willamette Valley. For thousands of years, natural disturbances like volcanic eruptions, climate change, and floods shaped the valley and deposited its deep, fertile soils. But more recent change was a direct result of human inhabitants. The Kalapuya arrived several thousand years ago. Kalapuya people believe that we've always been here, that Tlilu first woman walked down from the stone mountain and that was the origin of the life. The world was made of stone and we've always been here. We came from nowhere else and so we've been here since the world began. The Kalapuya were the first to manage the valley landscape to provide food for their people. One of their more important food sources was camas. Camas had hundreds of uses. Most commonly it was um, cooked and dried. It could be then pounded into a flour that you could make very flat cakes with. The Kalapuya people burned the valley. We knew that the burning of the fields was something that was very beneficial for camas. It grew very, very large. And that was one of the ways that the Kalapuya people tended the earth and made sure that the earth was rich and provided food for the people. The regular burning of the valley by the Kalapuya also created vast oak savannas and prairie grasslands that were ideal for hunting deer and elk and other game. But with the arrival of Euro-American settlers, another change was on its way. Well, Kalapuya people were once the largest Western Oregon Indian tribe. There were once 15,000 people. The population was um, reduced greatly by diseases and just by incidences in history being removed to the reservation. And so now we have three to 400 people. With the decline of the Kalapuyan people, burning of the valley stopped. Again, the need for food changed the face of the valley. As farms prospered and food production increased, oak savannas, upland prairies, and lowland wetlands began to disappear. With them went the camas, along with many other native plants and animals that had made these areas their home. 150 years of change began in the valley, in which Oregonians altered the landscape, introducing hundreds of non-native plants, channeling rivers, and draining and filling wetlands. The prairies and savannas that once blanketed the Willamette Valley became two of the most endangered habitats in the world. Today, less than 1% of the prairie, wetlands, and savanna habitats remain and are going to need our help if they're going to survive. Fort Hoskins was built in 1856 at the edge of the Coast Range, 22 miles west of Corvallis. 150 years ago, the landscape the fort soldiers knew was very different from today. Oak savannas, including native grasses and plants like Oregon iris and tarweed, surrounded the fort. While these Civil War era reenactors take pride in bringing back some of the original details of life at Fort Hoskins, this group of volunteers is trying to bring back some of the original native plant life by fighting off an invader that threatens to overrun the fort, Scotch Broom. Well, Scotch Broom is, is an invading species introduced from Europe, um, and uh, it's done 
particularly well uh, in the coast range in, uh, in western Oregon. People probably assume that uh, scotch broom is a native plant and it's part of uh, uh, the native landscape, when in fact uh, it, it's anything but that and it actually changes uh, the, uh, the whole ecological situation or setting that we have. And they shade the ground and uh, capture all the light and don't allow other plants uh, to get a start. And a stand like this would stay in place for perhaps 15 or 20 years, something like that. Today we have uh, volunteers from several different organizations, both pulling and in some cases clipping scotch broom here from the Greenbelt Land Trust and from the Forest Service, other people who are just uh, uh, neighbors just all have this common interest in trying to keep Scotch broom out and preserve uh, the native plants that we have here. One of those native plants threatened by Scotch broom and other invasives is Kincaid's lupin, a threatened species that supports an endangered species, a small blue butterfly, the Fender's blue. Well, when we talk about a blue butterfly, people are going to think frequently of the great big blue morpho butterflies of Brazil, which they see in butterfly houses and pictures and frames and things. It's not like that. It's about an inch in expanse. They look like flakes of sky. But the caterpillar will feed only on Kincaid's lupin. And it's very rare, too. It only occurs in a few places. Where that lupin still hangs out in the Willamette Valley, where it perseveres in tiny patches of original prairie, there's a good chance the Fender's Blue will live too. So they both became federally listed a few years ago. That gave them the uh, attention that they needed to get a lot of, of research and management done to where the butterfly might be said to be coming back now. So the fact is a lot of good people are doing a lot of good work on the Kincaid's Lupin and the Fender's Blue. Uh, and they, they've got a chance now of survival. So in honor of them, I wrote a little song called the uh, Fender's Blue Blues. I got the Fender's Blue Blues now, Kincaid Lupin Blues too. Got the Fender Blue Blues, boys, Kincaid Lupin Blues too. If we can keep the Lupins blooming, we just might save that Fender's Blue. Wetlands in the Willamette Valley are extraordinarily productive, nutrient-rich ecosystems and home to a rich diversity of plant and wildlife populations. Wetlands are an important part of the Willamette Valley's natural plumbing system, providing abundant, clean water, flood control, and biological diversity. But once again, human and natural history are intertwined. Since the settlement of the Willamette Valley and the quest for food production, over 99% of the wet prairie has been drained and either disappeared under the blade of the plow or under asphalt and buildings. Remnants of wet prairie remain in the Willamette Valley, but are now among the most endangered plant and animal communities in the nation. And with the increasing pressure of urban development, and a growing population, nature is going to need our help if wetlands are to survive. These Philomath High School botany students are making a difference on their local wetlands. They hand-raised rare threatened plants and are returning them to their native landscape. This is a checker mallow. Um, it used to be very common, however, now we've seen a great decline, um, mainly due to uh, different developments. And so uh, a great deal of wetlands was just paved over, obviously, which was harmful to the checker mallow among other species. Our main hope is to um, reintroduce the, the cycle of the wetlands and make sure that all the, all the species that are necessary um, and, that, and that work together are all present. I think we're all really attached to our plants and are excited to see them going out into the wetland again. All right. Go. 
oak savannas ringed much of the ancient Willamette prairies and wetlands. Located on higher and drier ground overlooking the valley, oak savannas are wide and grassy with scattered large Oregon white oaks. This unique open habitat was a direct result of regular burning by the Kalapuya Indians. But without fire or human intervention, conifers and other species quickly replace the oaks. And what little remains of these oak islands and the plant and animal communities that depend on them is threatened by development and agricultural conversion. Warren and Laurie Halsey are two Oregonians who have risen to the challenge to learn more about managing oak savannas. They have a passion for wildlife. It shows up in their art, their home, and their conversation. To support that passion, they've turned their 270-acre rain dance ranch near Alpine, Oregon, into a sanctuary for the education, art, and science of restoration of native Willamette Valley habitat, including the endangered oak savanna. Early on, uh, we sought uh, guidance from the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife in a wetlands restoration project. And that was very successful and very dramatic. But after that, we began to look at the hillside. And we were lucky to have some of these big oaks on our land. So we have sought uh, assistance from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife in oak restoration in terms of uh, maintaining the oaks themselves and encouraging more of the oak habitat for the woodpeckers and the bluebirds and all of these other creatures which depend on the oak savanna. In addition, we have, which is very typical in the Willamette Valley, of a lot of areas have, the oaks are very dense, they're very shrub-like. And those shrub-like oaks don't provide the habitat. The white-breasted nuthatches require the spreading oaks, not just oaks. So it's, the prize are those big, old ones that, that have the big cavities that the birds need. You think somebody lives in there this winter? <laughs> oh. So we took about 12 acres of very dense shrub-like oak, uh, and we actually went in mechanically and thinned that. And it's pretty phenomenal, even in just three years, to see how those young trees that we thinned out are responding. Fire is a key component of this. I mean, after all, that's how the Kalapuya Indians maintain the land as oak savanna. Uh, you stop burning, Douglas fir come in, the oaks themselves become really crowded. So today, it's a management tool. That set the stage so we could bring back the native plants. The more diversity you have in plants, the more diversity you're going to have in insects, the more diversity you're going to have on the bird species that, that feed upon them. So all the way up the chain, diversity offers the real opportunity to, to keep this planet functioning. There's a tremendous opportunity for small landowners. On a small property, you can actually care for these plants. If you have an island here and an island there, pretty soon you've done a whole lot with very few acres. It makes us feel fabulous. I adore seeing the seasonal changes and the yearly changes with the restoration work. The joyfulness that that the restoration and the living in the out of doors gives to us personally is beyond description. It, it lives in our souls. Driven by our need for food, shelter, and economic progress, we have vastly changed the Willamette Valley ecoregion wetlands, oak savannas, upland prairies. All these fragile Willamette Valley habitats will require our active involvement to help them thrive. It might be as simple as planting a native species, or removing invasive plants, or using fire, the ancient management tool of the Kalapuyans. But why should we care? Given our busy, technology-driven world, 
a world that has little to do with wetlands, savannas, or prairies. Why should we protect them? What we have is not going to last forever, that unless we take care of it, it's going to be gone. And if people reflect on what has been lost, what has gone extinct, what do you not find anymore, then reflect inside about what you can do to be a caretaker. Uh, the world would go on, I suppose, if we didn't do anything about Scotch broom, but uh, to many of us, I think we treasure our heritage. We'd like to see the, the plants and the animals that are part of uh, our native uh, landscapes here succeed and thrive. We are constantly looking at the future, and it goes beyond our lifetime. It's dynamic, it's full of change, and that's part of its drama, part of its beauty. Why should a piece of life be an object of our concern. It's hard to imagine, for example, that if that butterfly did die out, after all, we thought it was gone for half a century. Um, what difference is that gonna make? And we don't know. Uh, if anybody says, yeah, that's okay if that piece of life goes, well, I'd say mercy on them, you know, because that's, I, I'm not willing to say that about any given piece of life. The world is simply a richer place, more replete, more interesting, the more parts there are to it.